nation's capital, a place known for politics and power. When thinking of Washington, one does not necessarily think organic. Is it a surprise then to find that there's a restaurant in downtown DC serving only organic food? Is it amazing that the first American restaurant ever to win certification as organic is here in this city? And what, pray tell, do you expect to find directly out in front of an organic restaurant? A garden, of course, dill, rosemary, and parsley, right there where others would put the valet parking sign. Uh, first of all, you can Chef Nora Pouillon and her restaurant Nora, next on Chefs Afield. Let your life be regulated, as nature is, by the seasons. That is what you would hear from Moe and Jim Crawford, yep. tillers of the soil in Huston Town, Pennsylvania. You really feel that the soil is, is everything. For a quarter century now, the Crawfords have worked the soil, putting life into the ground as the earth feeds them and their neighbors, eschewing the violence of chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, overloaded fertilizers. Step along the rows of vegetables, reach out and pick something ripe. Reach out and pick it, and go ahead and eat it. There is no poison on it. The Crawfords are among the many organic farmers within driving distance of Washington, D.C., who are regular suppliers to Restaurant Nora. Organic food really can be grown only seasonally, and then you should eat plenty of it because you won't have it really for another year. Nora Pouillon. At Restaurant Nora, where that herb garden is out front, everything is organic, even the salt. Restaurant Nora, first opened in 1979, became the first American certified organic restaurant 20 years later, in 1999. Nora is not only celebrated internationally as a chef, but also as an advocate for organic living, for organic farming, cooking, and serving. It's not every farm that can sell to Nora. Only those who are farming organically, and those turn out to be people who are convinced, way down in their bones, of the value of organic. Well, you know, you know the, the last time when I saw you at, at your stand, I saw you had all these wonderful peppers, and it's pepper season again, and I am a big fanatic and trigger, but I love peppers. You only can get them you know, in the, in the end of the summer. and end until of August, the, uh, yeah. yeah. Until the first, what, the first frost in, in, yeah. in November or Well, something? and then we can hold them a little bit, a yeah. couple weeks after that. But, but uh, peppers yeah. don't hold very well because when they are right. red, it means they are really at their ripest. That's right. And they're yeah. sort of already declining. So, That's right. so I, I, I thought that, mm -hmm. oh, now is really the time for the peppers. So be so nice and show me where you grow these wonderful right. peppers. Okay. Let's check it out. I think they were wonderful. All the different varieties and some of them long and some yeah. of them fat and short and mm -hmm. yellow and let's let's pick them. Hey, hey Moi. Good to see you. There you have your great little peppers, my favorite crop. My favorite crop. Can I take one? Sure. Can I take one? I would mm -hmm. love to eat one. Ah. Mm -hmm. oh. I oh. grew this kind of pepper because um, at my market, which is a producer-only market, yeah. there are many, many peppers. So I thought I'd grow one that maybe was a little bit different, different. than the others. <laughs> it is, different. It is uh -huh. different. You know, the nice thing about being at an organic farmer is that you can just go pick it and eat it yeah. because you don't have to be afraid to eat all these pesticides. So I think, did you, did you find it on this uh, soil here, the, the peppers grow specifically well? Or why did you choose this plot? Yeah, we, we uh, this field actually has an interesting history. It, it really hasn't been, it's not, it didn't start out being real great soil, but we've been building it up for all the 25 years we've been here, building it up with cover crops and, and compost and manure and rotating the right kind of crops. And uh, You see, I, so think, we, I think many people don't understand that. I think many people don't understand that when you're an organic farmer, the most important thing is the soil. Yep. And that anything, you have to put everything into the soil and enrich the soil, otherwise whatever comes out 
I always say it doesn't have a soul and a life and, and yeah. any flavor or nutritional value or whatever. Well, people think that it's just a pesticide thing. I and, know, and I know. Of course, there, are, there aren't pesticides on these, and you can sort of tell because they're not perfect looking. <laughs> but, um, but really, yeah, there's so much good. more to it than just the, just the absence of pesticides. I mean, it's that whole soil building thing that, that gives you, that gives the plants the, the health that helps them resist the pest to begin with. Yes, you can eat as people used to, without wondering what else, what danger, has been put on the food. As a pepper ripens, it reddens, adding, in a natural way, taste and nutrition. Most peppers will start out being green and turn to whatever color the variety. And don't you think it's amazing that they have so much more nutritional value when they are red? Do you think it has something to do because then they're really ripe, and so they're full of the sort of their life and full of what mm -hmm. they can be. Mmm, that's a nice one. Great. Twist it a little bit off the, oh. there you go. Mm -hmm. I think many people don't know what to do with red peppers. And I think they don't know what to do with it because they only know really green peppers and many mm -hmm. people don't like that's green right. peppers. Mm -hmm. But I love red peppers. Yeah. You know, as a child, we had it for breakfast. So okay. I will have a bite. Mm. Is it sweet? Delicious. It's sweet, it's fleshy, you know, it's not skinny, it's fleshy, and it's unbelievably sweet. It's really where it's the reddest, it's the sweetest. Thick walls, we call that. I wonder if that's the same thing with tomatoes. Peppers and tomatoes are really closely related, too. Well, you have your really wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, tomatoes and all these different varieties. I think we should check them out. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let me show you a couple of tomatoes because they happen to be right here. We've got one here that, oh, in fact, well, you probably know what it is already, but it's... Uh... The Crawfords cultivate heirloom tomatoes. The seeds of an heirloom tomato are not mixed with other types. The heirloom has a direct line to antiquity, the earliest, purest strain. It's an heirloom variety called, we call green zebra. And, Where do you have the green? I love right the green here. zebra. And uh, actually, they look kind of yellow, but, but really, inside, they're really green. And uh, this one is is uh, is just about ripe. Well, it really is ripe. They get that little yellowish cast, and they have those green stripes. And uh, when you cut it open, which I probably could do for you, they uh, ah, the true farmer always they, does. They really, <laughs> they have a, they really are bright green inside. Mm. And see, see how nice they are. Oh. But they're completely ripe when they're this color. And and, and you uh, automatically assume they would be sour because they're green. Well, I like a tart tomato myself, and, and it's a tart tomato, but it's also got that sweetness too. The, it's not, it's the sugar, not tart, it's because acid. It's, well, okay, acid, whatever. And, uh, but, it's, but it's really a good tomato, though. It's, it's my delicious. favorite for flavor, yeah. Green zebra. And that's what's one of the heirlooms that we grow. We grow uh, several other heirloom varieties, and, as well as the standard red ones. This is a very controversial tomato. I bet many people said, oh, you have green tomatoes. Yeah, people think they're for frying or something, but they're really <laughs> not for frying because they're really yeah. completely ripe and juicy. Some of the names do are wonderful. The Arkansas Traveler, Black Cherokee. I mean, some of the names uh -huh. are just wonderful. Russian I mean, banana. Russian banana, yeah, I know. How can you call a tomato a Russian banana? At the restaurant, they have all different types of heirloom tomatoes. I'll serve it as a salad, like five or six varieties, a slice of each on a plate. Actually, now I serve it on a long plate, so they're lined up like little soldiers. Yeah. And in between, I put some mozzarella, some fresh mozzarella, not that much, sprinkle it with some uh, shredded basil and pour olive oil, good olive oil, all over it. When uh, you invited us to the restaurant, it was the first time I really appreciated heirloom tomatoes. We started growing them, <laughs> but I remember that dish. I don't know if it was a long plate or whatever, but <laughs> no, it was no, a no, beautiful yeah, plate. No, I, I, all I, those different colors and, yes. and shapes and sizes. I, and I love it. It's a classic Italian dish. It's tomato with mozzarella and basil, uh, but, no. uh, but I made we it We have it at home all, all the time now. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> great, <you> that's <laughs> great. So, well, can we see the, the, the cherry tomatoes, the golden? Sure. Yeah. The golden. Let's, let's pick them. Mm. Okay, Nora, let me show you these uh, sun gold cherry tomatoes. Oh, they look and gorgeous. You probably know all about them already, but yeah, I'm yeah, going to tell I'm you what them. I tell my customers at Farmer's Market. Yeah, please do that, they're so They're so great when they're on the vine, too, and they become in these big clusters. But they're just a great snack item because they're so sweet. Once you start on them, you can't, you can't stop. stop. 
Yeah. We just pop. <coughs> yeah. It has to do with your wonderful soil. You worked so hard on getting this soil so great. Well, that's probably that probably is a, a, a factor because we really find that the different soils give us different kind of tomato and different kind of tomato flavor. Doing th different things to build the soil in different ways, and especially trace elements and these micronutrients that you get from compost and so on. Since we've been here on this farm and building the soil for 25 years already, we have got tomatoes that are way better quality in flavor, especially than we ever had at the beginning. The first few years, we were always disappointed with our tomatoes for flavor. Mm -hmm. They looked okay, but they, they didn't have the flavor and they didn't have the, a good deep color either. The sequence of the weather, they say, really has, yeah. has a, an influence on the flavor too. And they certainly need to have good green leaves to make sugar and, and plenty of sun. But yeah, generally speaking. So what do you mean? They need the green leaves to, for, to yeah. oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nature tells us, eat now. I mean, I always tell my customers, eat now. And on my menu, I have tomato soup, tomato salad, tomato sauce, tomato sun-dried, a tomato yeah. oven-dried, tomato grilled, you know, even tomato sorbet. I mean, I do tomato, tomato, because now you should do it. It has so much more flavor. Yeah. And then you can think about it as part of the other Summer. things you do in yeah. that season and identify it with family picnics or whatever, and then you get into the winter, you can enjoy your cabbage and your beets and I know, things like I know, that. I, and then, I agree. And, and you don't need the tomatoes anymore because you already had enough tomatoes in the summer. We love to eat seasonally, and, and of course we love when our customers learn to eat seasonally too. I remember I was once interviewed and this person said to me, but how do you know when it's in season? And I was just shocked that she asked me this question, but then I realized, why would she know? Because in yeah. the supermarket, you get it all year yeah. round. Yeah. So you don't know that it comes from yeah. Mexico or from New yeah. Zealand or from Israel. Yeah, my customers in my farmer's market, some of them have been coming to us for 30 years. And I get such a kick out of the fact that some of them have really learned like which week the certain <laughs> you know thing is gonna show up and they'll be asking me, you know, isn't it about time for the eggplants <laughs> to show up? You know, because they really have learned this, that when the things are in season. A tomato grown in your own yard, or down the street, or on a farm nearby, that's a tomato. A tomato grown halfway around the world and shipped in a cardboard suitcase. That's a red, round thing. Tomatoes just don't travel well. Organic farming is more than numbers, bushels, dollars, tons, acres, and productivity. It is the farmer's pledge to his customers, his promise to the land is custodial duty to pass along healthy, clean land. Organic food on the table is the server's pledge of oneness with nature, of sustenance away from the artifice of the chemical lab. Healthful, alive, delicious. Organic farmers, as we have seen, they really put a lot of work in the soil. And it's the soil that's full of microorganisms and energy and life. And whatever you grow in that soil will have life too. And we all have to eat. We all have to eat, we have all to drink, and we all have to breathe. So why not eat food that gives us energy and life and doesn't give us terrible pesticides, which unfortunately conventional food does. So that's why I decided I want only wholesome food. And that's what I decided to do, to have an organic restaurant, because I served it at home, and I felt what I serve at home, I have also to give to my customers. We have seen wonderful, wonderful peppers. And I have to tell you, peppers are really something I'm looking forward all summer to. So let me first show you how to slice a pepper. It's really very easy to do. And in the restaurant, what we do, we, you know, we have to be fast. So what we do, we just cut on each side a wedge away. And you have your, like this, you have a slice. And then here, if you like a long slice, you slice it like this. By the way, this little white pass has a lot of nutritional value on it, so I always keep it. If you want a smaller slice, you can cut it sideways. To cook peppers, this is the easiest way. And let me show you now what is a good general way of cooking then a base that becomes the, the base for many different dishes. We saute first a few onions. I always cook with olive oil. I love olive oil. And I like a lot of olive oil. Some sliced onions. Then maybe some chopped garlic. 
and we take our peppers. You can do a mix of them or you can do just red ones. I love the red ones, so I always like to do more. And you just basically saute them. Now we season them. Little salt. Of course, I use organic pepper, freshly ground. We always grind it in the morning for the day's need. And now it depends where you want to go next. Do you want to stay in a Mediterranean country? Then we use Mediterranean flavoring. You can use fennel seed if you want to. You can use some basil or some thyme. It really depends on what you like. If you like rosemary, you can use rosemary. If you don't like any of these herbs, you can just use parsley. There they are getting there. So if you want to stay in the Mediterranean uh, line, you really stick with all. You can even add some orange peel or some lemon peel if you want to, to give it some extra flavor. Really, it's up to you. The most important thing is really the onions, the olive oil, a little bit of garlic, salt, pepper, and then or basil or rosemary, whatever you want. The thing to do then, this is a perfect dish to serve, for instance, with fish. Actually, it's called red rockfish. It comes from Alaska. Season it again with a little salt and pepper on both sides. You let your pan get really hot. That's very important. You sear your fish. Can you see now how it gets white here on the bottom? Mm -hmm. How the fish starts to cook from the bottom up? So if you do it only in a pan, you wait until it dries halfway, and then you turn it, and then you cook it halfway, and it's done. If you, if you do it in the oven, you can go now, turn it. You see how it cooked halfway? Take your fish. You put the whole dish in the oven. The nice thing about these peppers is that they become your sauce and your vegetable. Take our fish from the oven. You can add a little more sauce, some kind of sauce like an aioli, which is a garlic mayonnaise, or sprinkle it with herbs, some boiled baby potatoes, Corolla potatoes, and a sauce. You can do a sauce with sweet peppers too. You mix it with a mayonnaise, with a garlic mayonnaise. It's called a rouille. You can even go with that, or we can just go with a plain aioli. Put some on top of the fish, and then you decorate it with a little bit of basil if you want to. And here you are. Other way of doing the pepper is to roast them. And cause a lot in Mediterranean countries, they really roast peppers because the flavor comes more out. And roasting, I would think, is still a misdemeanor because basically what you do, you nearly char them. You really burn the outside skin, the hard skin, you burn it off and it sort of intensifies the, the flavor of the flesh. You just put it straight on the gas flame or you can put your pepper on the grill. After the peppers are black as here, you put them in a bowl and you cover the bowl with uh, a plastic wrap so they steam and of course they get cool. Because if they don't get cool, you cannot touch them and peel them. And also you want them to steam a little you see how, how charred, when I say charred, I mean charred. So you want to steam them a little so the skin comes easily off. See how easy the skin comes off? It just sort of falls off. It's really very easy and it's with every pepper like this. 
Some people do this under running water, but I feel these juices here are delicious. I always try to save them and then put them in uh, uh, and run it through a sieve and add it to the dish, whatever I'm doing. The, the easiest thing to do with peppers is an appetizer, where you just slice them in bigger pieces, put them on your platter, drizzle them with olive oil, some herbs, add whatever you want to it. Some pitted black olives, these are dried cured olives, but you even don't have to pit them, you can leave them whole. You can add some capers to it. You may add uh, some anchovies, if you're a lover of anchovies. You can sprinkle, if you want, with some little orange peel. And then you take your best olive oil and sprinkle it over. And I like to do a little bit of balsamic, just for added flavor. And there you are, your appetizer. The other thing you can do with them, of course, is soup. We put our, again, our sauteed julienne peppers in the blender and you can make two types of soup here. If you serve it cold, and you season it with balsamic vinegar and olive oil. You add some chicken stock to it. Season it, salt, and a little bit of pepper. You puree it. And there you are. And you just add a little bit of cream to it. And there you are. If you haven't heated up your cream, then you have to uh, heat up the whole soup now, or you can serve it right this, right away. You can garnish it. You can sprinkle some crab meat on top, a little lobster meat, or, or some grilled shrimp, or you can just decorate it with a little reduced balsamic vinegar, or here I have some chive oil just some chive oil to give it a little more flavor, or you just sprinkle it with some fresh herbs. And here is your soup. The food is grown when it is its season, and organically to, to come to its full ripeness. And of course, local helps a lot too, because it doesn't have to be shipped across the country for miles away, so it can be picked just when it's at its best, but most flavorful. Start farming organic. Start cooking organic. And you go places you didn't know existed. It's really the season. It has so much more flavor. Yeah, the, the flavor difference is amazing. 